it's time for a reading wrap up. Hello my lovely friends, it's Margaret. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be talking about what I read in the months of July and August. Y'all thought I had skipped the July wrap up, didn't you? Nah, I was just too lazy to film one wrap up for two books, so we're doing a Jalogist wrap up. So I'm going to talk about all of the books together, but let's talk about how each perspective month went. As I have already mentioned, I only read two books in the month of July. It was a pretty mediocre reading month. The books weren't bad, they just were not my favorite things I have ever read. In August I read 11 books and I am happy to say that like my reading month overall was much better in regards to how much I like the books. Sometimes you can correlate quantity with quality. The first book I read in the month of July is Daughter of Red Winter by Ed McDonald. This is an adult fantasy that follows Rain. She has a specific type of magic that allows her to see the dead and in the world that she lives in that kind of magic is feared and people who are found to have that magic end up getting stoned to death. We end up following Rain in this book after an act of kindness ends up getting her involved in like greater forces that are happening in her world and then the politics of the Drowhen Monastery. Um, the Drowhen monks are the ones that are kind of in charge of the official accepted form of magic in her country. I ended up giving Daughter of Red Winter three stars. I did like this. This was not an unpleasant reading experience and I thought that it was overall well written. I liked the magic system and a lot of the like questions that it raised and some of the things that they explored through it. I would have liked um, a little bit more though when it came to that because there were some places that were unclear in my opinion. I also enjoyed Rain's journey because it wasn't like solely about Rain accepting her powers and all of that stuff but it, that is part of it and I do like those kinds of stories where she's learning more about her powers and she's having to learn okay this is how I fit in the world and learning how to use them in ways that end up basically saving everyone's asses. It does have a little bit of the not like other girls syndrome in there. I think it's countered by the fact that Rain does have several female friendships that she is involved in but she's she's a little judgy and um judgmental at the beginning of the book and slightly less so at the end of the book if you are looking for sapphic and queer content this may be going that way like she definitely has a little baby by awakening moment and i definitely think well i have thoughts about who the love interest is going to be but i haven't solely ruled out other possibilities just yet just based on some of the stuff that happened in this book. I also want to mention that there is there's just a lot of casual fat phobia in this book. We do have a fat character that I thought starting out like the way that he was described it was kind of neutral and I was like oh that's really cool if we're just like body neutral in this. We're not we're not sitting here like shaming him for being fat. It's just that that's who he is. That's how he is. It's his, his description. And then every single time we see this character they are describing what he is eating. He is all like almost always eating in this book and that was just one of those things that I was like guys like why is he always the one that we are focusing on eating? Most of the fat phobic stuff in here was like that. There is one outright fat phobic comment that we get in Rain's head that just so yeah, if that is something that puts you off of a book, definitely know that that is in there. The second and final book that I read in July was A Prada and Prejudice by Mandy Hubbard. This is one of the books that was on my These Books Will Self-Destruct if I haven't read them in six months. I now officially have seven months to read all of the books that were on that list. I may need all seven of those. This is a YA portal fantasy following Callie who when wearing a pair of Prada heels, trips, falls, hits her head, and wakes up in the countryside of Regency, England. I'm not gonna lie, this was a bit of a weird plot. Like, the whole thing about this 14-year-old falling and, and finding herself in Regency, England, and some of the stuff that was included, I was just like, this is such an interesting concept, but the it just doesn't really work as is with the character being the character that she is. In contrast to the last book that we talked about, this one actually I think tackles the not like other girls trope in a way that like is actually addressing it and having the character learn stuff throughout the book that just kind of like it's a plot point. It is part of her journey is addressing 
these thoughts within herself. I'm going to be honest, I feel like this would have worked much better if we had had an older protagonist. Basically, when she wakes up, she goes and she finds like this manor house and the girl who lives there thinks it's her long lost friend from America who is the same age as, I don't remember what her name is, Emily, the same age as Emily. And so everyone thinks she's 18. And so it makes things really weird with the love interest who's in his early 20s. So we either needed to make him like a very young lord where he's like 16 or we needed to make her like somebody needed to be 16 or 17 or 18 in this situation because even at 14 that was just it was a little weird. I gave this three stars. I found it fun to read but not really impactful as a overall as a book. I do think that this would be an interesting one to hand your like middle grade or YA reader to kind of have a conversation with them about like how we view other women and the way internalized misogyny affects all of us but like not not anything I'm going to be going back to. After that we move into August. The first book that I finished in August was The Last Session Volume 1 Roll for Initiative by Jasmine Walls. I gave this five stars. This is a graphic novel. It follows a group of college kids as they are going into the last session of a D&D &D game that they started in high school. They're all college age, they're about to graduate, and they're going to be going off and splitting up and no longer be like in the same physical space as they were. And in that they are also bringing the DM's girlfriend in as a player and that causes a little bit of friction because she is very very new. I thought that this was super super cute. It is about friendship and identity and growing up. It talks a lot about change both good and bad and how we as people handle it and sometimes it's really cute because like sometimes some of the real world conversations will start out like they're a conversation in the like their little fantasy world but like the context cues and the way that the panels are done and then shifted back into the real world shows that this is actually like a real world conversation that is happening kind of tackling some of what is going on with the dynamic of this group. If you are looking for something fun and wholesome and wonderful, I definitely suggest reading this. I'm realizing I actually missed a book. I did also read Batter Royale by Liesl Adams. I gave this four stars. This is another graphic novel and we are following two characters. One of them is like the son of a restaurant owner and his mom's restaurant is slowly kind of dying out. And then we have our main character whose name I cannot remember but she is wanting to go to culinary school and she's really she really loves cooking and is very good at cooking and so they end up entering in this contest called Batter Royale. It's a competitive baking contest over in London with kind of high stakes. So I ended up giving this four stars. I thought that this was really fun and cute. There's a romance between the two main characters and I really really liked that. Like I liked a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that we had with the characters and getting to know them and like finding out about his mom's restaurant and about her parents issues. She finds out at the beginning of this that her parents are possibly separating and she's dealing with that on top of the fact that she is going to be graduating from high school and she's going to have to consider like what college am I going to and the one she really wants may not necessarily have the money for. Their relationships and all the behind the scenes stuff I really really enjoyed. The baking contest was a little bit like weird because like it was there but it wasn't there. Like it's this really weird intense baking contest with like traps and having to do like death defying stunts. With as much hype and stuff as is devoted to this contest and energy and all of that, like the actual contest baking part of it did not last very long and I would have liked a little bit more of that. I feel like we needed some of that to round it out. All in all, it was still a very fun, enjoyable story and it read very quickly. After that, I finished By the Book by Jasmine Guillory. This is a very cute adult romance. I gave it four stars. This is part of the Meant to Be series where each book is a retelling of a different Disney fairy tale. This one specifically is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast if they yellow dress and blue outfit. Didn't give that away. Follows Izzy. We see her in the prologue as a brand new editorial assistant at Tale as Old as Time Publishing. She is one of the only black employees at this particular publishing house. And then we are in chapter one. It's five years later and she's feeling very overworked, underpaid, burnt out. She's just very demoralized both on like the editorial front, on her own personal writing front. She's with her boss at this function trying to figure out, do I still want to do this? Is this something that like works for me? And she ends up volunteering to go out for her boss to this kind of like childhood stars house and get a manuscript that he has been promising them for a very very long time. Doing that she ends up getting roped into staying in California 
and helping coach him through writing this memoir that he is supposed to be writing. From what I have gathered kind of following different publishing professionals online, this is a very realistic portrayal of what it is like to be in publishing and be a person of color, specifically in this case a black woman. We definitely do explore the fact that she is the only black employee at her publishing house and how that affects her and how that makes her feel. Now with that said, it is very fun. The relationship that builds between her and Bo is super, like it's cute. It's it's a little wonky at the beginning because he is a curmudgeon at the beginning. He's a little gruff, he's a little bit of a recluse, and then as we go and he kind of warms up to her, he starts to like be like, okay, like I know how I was at the beginning, but let me show you that like that's I just like you were a stranger showing up to my house and I am a former child star who is used to people being weird about shit and now that I know you it's it's fine. Like I liked seeing the way that that relationship grew. Pacing wise, I think that it was beautifully and perfectly paced for the story that was being told and I really like bought the build in their relationship. So I think it was really fun, really cute and if you are into fairy tale retellings and romance novels, definitely pick this one up. After that, we continued my Full Metal Alchemist reread with volume 13. If you don't know what Full Metal Alchemist is about, hi, you must be new here. This is a series that follows two brothers who, in an alchemy mishap, end up just screwing themselves over. One of them loses his entire body, the other one now has an auto male arm and leg to replace the ones that were taken in this exchange that happened during this alchemical mishap, and this follows them trying to get their original bodies back, um, especially like with this one we start building up the pressure of the fact that Al's time may not be long, like is his soul really tethered to this suit of armor? I give this four stars. It is a lot of backstory and a lot of setup, getting characters into the places that they will need to be for the rest of the series. There's a lot that we are finding out in this volume, so like action-wise it's okay, story-wise it's okay, but we don't get as much time with the characters as I would like, especially not my favorite character. After that, I finished Savage City by L. Penelope. This is the first book in the Bliss Wars series. So I gave this four stars. It is a story following two protagonists. We have Talia, who is from our world, and then we have Ryan, who is from like an alternate dystopian version of our world. And it starts when Talia dies and wakes up and finds herself in this other world. And it turns out that she is like the other world doppelganger for a princess who has been missing and presumed dead. She ends up being brought into this royal family having to like pretend like she has amnesia. She doesn't want them to find out who she is because she thinks that then they'll put her like outside in the wild but then she ends up getting pulled into some political stuff that's going on. Most of the adult characters in her world have gone through some sort of trial where they end up getting attached to a daemon and it takes a couple of different forms like Ryan the way that it works is his daemon is with him and it's a part of him but it is not like does not change his physical form whereas Talia like the family that she the royal the princess belongs to they actually shift to be the form of their daemon. I did really, really enjoy this. I liked like the alternative dystopian idea. She wakes up in an alternate version of San Francisco where a whole bunch of stuff has gone down and people are reliant on this substance called bliss in order to power different things. And you have different factions, like the royal family is like, well, we need this and people are hoarding it and it like it makes people's lives easier. Meanwhile, the people outside the city are going, we need to protect this resource. We should not be using it willy-nilly. There is a, you know, a metaphor obviously there. And I really like the play and the conversations that were happening around that. It definitely grabs you at the beginning and has you hooked all the way to the end. I finished this in like two days. I started it on Saturday after I finished to buy the book and it was done by Sunday. I also really liked the magic system that the, the daemon kind of system that goes about and like the trials that people go into. There's also like some um, like soul magic I guess. Like there are like three different types of self that you can have in this one and I don't remember I think it's voice, shadow, and soul and like the way that that interplayed and how they talk about like if you lose one you're okay but if you lose two there's a problem. Like all of like how that works was just really interesting to see and to like be reading about and I cannot wait to see more of what El Penelope does in this world. I picked this up because I like El Penelope's writing. I've read part of her other adult fantasy series uh, Song of Earth and Blood. I'll have a, the review that I did right up here and so I really enjoyed that and I think she does definitely pull that into this and it makes it 
even better as a story. After that, I pulled up my Arc of Oleander by Jennifer Allison Provost. This is an indie published novel and it's the first in a, the Poison Garden series. We follow, I do not know if it is Ellie or Eli. Her name is Eliza, so I could see Ellie being a, a thing, but it is spelled Eli, so I'm just gonna call her Eliza. This is an adult paranormal mystery. I ended up giving it four stars as well, and what is happening in this is uh, Eliza is a seer, and seers are kind of like, they're like the hub of the magical world in this particular book. Her mother was the last kind of main seer, and Eliza has been avoiding that due to things that happened in her past. Instead of becoming a seer and stepping into her grandmother's role now that her grandmother is gone, Eliza is a private detective. She is called out to an investigation and then ends up having to exercise a demon from someone. One of the witch elders in her town ends up dead and so she's pulled into the investigation of that. Plus there is a police dude detective that is like knows something is up with her and is also hitting on her. There's a lot going on in this very, very short book and I really, really enjoyed it so much that I went out and I, like, I bought this and then I also pre-ordered the second book. Partly because that ending is just like, literally cuts off almost in the middle of a conversation. I picked this up and I could not put it down. I was putting things off that I also really wanted to do for this book. It was just, just, grabbed me and I needed to know what happened next. It is very basic and run-of-the-mill. I don't think it is anything special when it comes to paranormal books or mystery books. None of that. Some of the stuff is really like probably very obvious. It's the like character and the world and what's going on with Eliza personally that really had me invested in wanting to know more. I found the mystery compelling and then linked with the interpersonal drama like it's just like this wonderful little concoction of things that I really like. There was like a really weird and frustrating love triangle and I just like I understand why it exists because of plot things but at the same time I was like I really wish this didn't exist. Like, I'm not not a fan of what is going on here. This dude is weird. Why are you even interested when the hot dude is over here? And like, doing your freaking, I think it's her dishes. He does her dishes and she's not like, hey, would you like to get married? Voluntarily. She doesn't have to ask him. He's just like, well, she's just been knocked out. I am going to help her clean her apartment. Like, we're just gonna tidy things up so when she wakes up, they're not gonna be dirty. I'm like, what? There was not even a competition here. The ending, like I said, was weird and abrupt and I'm not sure how I feel about it. Like, that's part of why it did not get five stars. That and, like, obviously we're, it's a detective and he's a cab. That's not how it works. That's not how it works, actually. There are definitely ways that this would have gone very differently if she'd been working with a real police officer. But yeah, the ending was weird to me and I'm like, that's, could we at least have finished the conversation. After that, I finally picked up and finished Batman Detective Comics Volume 1, Rise of the Batman. This is by James Tinian IV and then Eddie Barrows, Elvaro Martinez, Eber Herrera, and Rolf Hernandez are involved in the art. This is one of the volumes that came out as part of the DC's Rebirth line when they had to reboot their reboot. I'm never gonna, I'm not gonna shut up about that because it is extremely hilarious to me. I really loved seeing the team get together. We get to follow like Tim Drake, we get to follow Stephanie Brown, we have Clayface in the mix, we get Cassandra Kane back like in the spotlight having some of her own stories again. We have Kate and we have Bruce obviously. It's really interesting seeing them come together and work with the team and seeing Bruce actually like turn to Kate and be like hey I can't do everything. I need your help with this. I think that this would be something that's good for us to do. I really really enjoyed it. I did miss Damien and I know apparently James Tinian does not like Damien as a character which just bothers me. I don't like it. I wish more writers involved Damien in storylines because I definitely think that there is some, um, there's some bias going on there for multiple, on multiple levels. I really liked seeing Kate in this kind of leadership role and being put in this position of trust by Bruce and him having like, they being like, well, I obviously have someone who knows what they're doing that can help me do what I think needs to be done. And then one of the things I really liked is how we have a villain in this one that is kind of a mirror to Tim in ways. Like, if he had not been a good person, this is who he could have become. Once that one was finished, I finally sat down and just bit the bullet and finished Tiamat's Wrath by James S.A. Corey. 
the more I get into these last three books, the more I am kicking myself for not staying on top of them because they are just that good. He, they just, like, James S.A. Corey knows how to write a frickin' book. Once again, we're giving this a five star. I can't talk to you about how much I love these books. This is the best one so far in the series. The fact that we get, like, such a major Naomi plotline, we get to see her, like, being the badass we've always known she like she's always been a badass and just getting her to kind of just watching her be able to level up in badassery it's it's just mm, and and the way that like her relationship with jim gets affected by stuff and like how just what a he's just he's a stan he's a wife guy and they're not married but he's a wife guy and it's just wonderful to see him be like oh yeah that's what naomi's doing yeah i'm here yeah what do you need babe like just it's perfect it is perfection yeah everything is is coming together uh we are getting ready for the final book there are a lot of things in play the number of ways they have figured out to take this protomolecule stuff molecule i know how to talk and twist it and make it new every time and new complications and like they just keep throwing wrenches in the works that make you go well this is not as simple as i thought it was going to be and i love it it's great it's wonderful it's a master class in writing also master class in how to do character deaths in a way that like doesn't piss your audience off but really just adds to the freaking story i'm not okay with it it made me unhappy but at the same time oh that's just the way that's the way it was meant to happen. I never say that about character deaths. I never do that. I never do that. That's, that is a new thing for me. Also, if James S.A. Corey is watching this, what the f***? You know what I'm talking about. Can you imagine if they were actually watching my video? I mean, it wouldn't offend them because like, do I ever say anything bad about these books? No, I don't. I don't. I have no, no objectivity. After that, I knocked out a second. These books will self-destruct if I don't read them book. And that is Wool by Hugh Howie. I now have eight months to complete that list. Hooray. Got three stars. It was okay. We follow Jules in a post-apocalyptic world where people are living in silos. They are obviously climate controlled. Like everything that they need is in these silos. And Jules is one of the mechanics that ends up like she starts out as a mechanic who is involved in the upkeep because of certain interactions that the sheriff had with her. The main, like there's one main sheriff and then people under him, but like he dies she ends up stepping into his role because of his feedback from her help with the case this book had a really solid premise and a very solid like middle to end the beginning in my opinion takes way too long for us to get introduced to jules we follow um whatever his name the first sheriff and then we follow the mayor for a good like okay so hold on let me find it all of that not our main character a lot of it i think if Hugh Howie had condensed that and gotten us to Jules quicker or interspersed this with stuff that was going on in Mechanical with Jules. I think it would have been a much tighter, much better narrative. It would have read a little bit, like it would have been grabbed a little bit sooner because I really was not grabbed until we got to the end of part two and we'd met Jules and we knew some of what was going on and what her like actual struggles and what she was going to be going up against would be. It's really funny because we have a main female character and I think he does a pretty good job of writing a female prota protagonist. There are no moments where you're sitting there going, this, that's not how the female, that's not how our bodies work, sir. But, ooh, hold on, let me fix that. There are places where you're like, really? Misogyny? You couldn't, you couldn't imagine a future where that, this, situation this thought process is not happening like it's not throughout the whole book but there are some characters are just like why couldn't we just have a story where where we're beyond that because it's not part of Jules it's like it's not we're not making a comment on what's going on with Jules it's not part of her story it's just something that is in the thoughts of another point of view character that we see that just bugged me I was like come on is your imagine like your imagination couldn't couldn't go somewhere else for that I do think that this definitely does something interesting with the like dystopian trope of having a small group of people that know the truth and then a main protagonist that ventures outside of the box to discover 
like they've been lied to for most of it. Like that's that's very much the trope that's going on here. But it's really interesting how they do it because like the lie, the main lie that the people in these novels have been fed is true. I just thought that was an interesting way to turn that kind of post-apocalyptic dystopian trope on its head and explore it in a different way. Anyways, I definitely think that there are reasons to read this book. I gave it three stars. I thought it was a decent job, but again, that ending was just, not ending, the beginning was just way too long. Just way too much time to get to the actual plot. You'll note, I'm saying that having just picked up a book that's like a hundred pages longer and thought that that was perfectly paced. It's not long books that I have a problem with. It's how you, how you pace them and how you write them. Speaking of post-apocalyptic novels, we have to talk about A Half-Built Garden by Ruthanna Emrys. This got five stars. If I had not read Tiamat's Wrath, this would have been my favorite book this month. It was so well done. I, it's an adult, hopeful, dystopian. We follow Judy and this is in the late 2000s, like it's 2080 something at this point in the novel. There has been a climate crisis and people are in the process of actually like dealing with the climate crisis in a functional way. Like they're actually, we pick up in a place where they are actually repairing a lot of the damage that was done to the to the environment, to the planet. They have what they call these watersheds where everyone is kind of involved in the decision making. They have hijacked the social media algorithm to like make it work so that like people, like people with good ideas and with expertise are able to rise to the top and have their opinions known before decisions are made. Like there's a lot of, I guess, group think but in a way that's like, hey, we want to hear from everybody and then from there we will decide what is the best way to tackle this problem. Anyways, we have Judy. She is one of the scientists that like is responsible for maintaining her specific watershed, which I believe is the Chesapeake watershed. And one night she gets some weird sensor readings on her device, her mesh. And so she and her wife and their brand new baby girl, who I think she's like a couple of months old at the beginning of this, they go out to look at the readings. She's like, it's probably a, um, like a fluke. It's probably nothing wrong or something just needs to be adjusted just based on what she's seeing in these readings. But we'll go, we'll check it out. It's like the middle of the night. And so they go out there and there is a spaceship. Aliens have landed. And it turns out that Judy's showing up with her child strapped to her chest is actually a good thing because these particular aliens, like having children involved in diplomatic stuff is very, very important to them. It's part of their culture. It's a whole thing. I have feelings about that as a functional way to do democracy or negotiation or whatever they're doing. I don't, but it was interesting to see that. I liked the way that this tackled progress and changed and I like the fact that it's like kind of like hope punk I guess is kind of the term the lights back it was nice to see a post-apocalyptic novel that's like hey we got past the apocalypse if you look at history climate change is not the first apocalypse that people have faced and the people who have faced those apocalypses have still survived them they are still here despite what some people would try to tell you. So I liked that we were taking a hopeful approach, that we were taking a, hey, the earth can still, we're not too far gone, the earth can still be healed, we can still, like, we can still change things, we can still make things better, we can still undo this damage. It's very interesting as a first contact story, like the aliens or something else, and I liked, like, the weird stuff that it explored. There's this very interesting parallel between Carol and Judy and the fact that they are now in kind of a co-parent relationship with two other people that have been brought into their home. The ideal society is like you have a house that's got a lot of people that are involved in the raising. Like Judy grew up as part of a polycule and a very large household where there are lots of parents. But we have this kind of initial setup where Judy and Carol are kind of getting to know these new co-parents. Um, they didn't, like it wasn't a situation, it was kind of like a matchmaking situation. So they're still getting to know each other, still getting to know like what's the relationship going to be like. But then we also have the parallel of the aliens coming in and kind of seeing that same situation playing out on a much larger scale. This definitely examines past stuff that has happened in American history. I don't think you could have written a plot where someone with bigger, better technology and weapons comes in and tries to say, hey, this is what we think you should do and not have some callbacks to dumb shit that colonialism has done. Um, so that is definitely explored in this. It's not a main plot point, but it's definitely conversations that are had. And then I will say there is a trigger warning 
um, for attempted kidnapping. One other thing that I do want to mention is I love Judy's relationship with religion. I love how that is explored in the novel. I love how her relationship kind of just is and how like just how it works with who she is as a person and works with things that are like informs what's going on as she is doing what she's doing. Um, like she's doing her job, doing the things that she's dealing with the aliens, as she's trying to kind of explain humanity to them and the fact that like people may not want to leave Earth because these aliens show up and they're like, hey, we're here to get you off this planet because y'all are technologically advanced enough that you're going to burn everything down. And Judy's like, we have put so much work into fixing what we did and it's working. We don't want to leave. The final book that I read in the month of August was The Darkness Outside Us by Elliot Schrepper. This is a YA science fiction about two boys. We follow our main protagonist, Ambrose, and then his kind of shipmate, Kodiak. Ambrose wakes up with no memory, like he knows about the mission that he is on, but he has no memory of actually boarding the ship, taking off, etc, etc, and the kind of AI that's in charge of the ship is like, hey, yeah, you were injured in the takeoff, you've been in a coma just to protect your brain for a while, and now you're finally healed enough that I can wake you up. They are on a mission to save Ambrose's sister. She went out to one of the moons on Jupiter, I believe it is Titan, and then no one heard from her until, like, an, a beacon went off, and now he and this other guy, Kodiak, are supposed to be going out to see what's going to happen. They are also coming from a society where like it's basically a second cold war where you have the federation and you have uh democratia and they are from opposing sides of that and they're having to also work learn to work together despite having slightly different viewpoints on a lot of things. I ended up giving this three stars. I had a lot of fun for most of this book. I found Ambrose and Kodiak really interesting protagonists. I think we get to know Ambrose a little bit better than we get to know Kodiak because we are in Ambrose's head for the entire thing and I kind of wish that were not the case. I wish we had been able to get into Kodiak's head a little bit more instead of just perceiving him as Ambrose perceives him. It did have a really compelling mystery that has you like just like pulls you through the first part of the plot. However, I do know that people are like, oh my god, this twist, What? what is this like so like shocked and awed by this twist that happens? And in my opinion, it's not that groundbreaking of a twist. Like I felt like, like I feel like the twist itself, not the novel, but the twist itself was kind of overhyped. I also think that if you are a heavy duty sci-fi reader, you may struggle with this book because there is a lot in here that is not explored and that I found wishing had been explored. There is a lot that like I'm sitting there going, okay, but this is actually a, like, why, why are we doing this this way if the technology is advanced to the point that is supposedly is advanced in this novel? I can't tell you like details about that because it has to do with the twist, but like, it doesn't make any sense that they're able to do what they're able to do and we haven't done this other thing instead. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm sorry. But my biggest issue is that like, I don't know, <laughs> this is going to be very, very hard for me to talk about because it is spoilers for the ending. But the ending that we got, I have feelings about that being the ending for AYA. If this was an adult novel, that would work much better for me. But the fact that we have two 17 year old boys that are being put in this position and there was a vlog that will eventually be coming out when I finish other things involved in it that does spoil things and gets more into my thoughts about this. But like just like this ties into partly that I do work with foster kids or not work with but like part of my job involves reading the reports um, that are brought in for foster kids. I know 17 year olds can handle this and have handled this and have been in this situation but the fact that this great happy ending is these two 17 year olds being in this situation rubs me a little bit the wrong way. I wish that instead of having what happens fully realized I wish it had just been something that the reader knows is a possibility in the future when they are ready for it. If this is the ending that Elliot Schreffer wanted to write I think we needed to have characters that were in their early to mid 20s instead of being 17. That's just kind of where I am with that. I think it would have been better as an adult. Like this was a solid like four star book until we got to that last bit and we had like that's the ending and then also 
there are certain plot elements that like I'm like why was this even part of the conflict then if this is where we were going to end up with this particular situation character thing that's going on like I felt so it felt so anticlimactic to go from one mode in regards to this thing to oh yeah now everything's cool and I'm just like why like I understand that the first part had to exist for this plot to be the plot that it is but to just like have everything be all happy and 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 everything with that with no like examination of it she's like oh yeah we're cool with this now I just don't like it anyways it's cute it's an interesting concept I do recommend it I think there are people who are going to like it much much more than I do I just have read a lot of sci-fi and I've seen it done better all right it's time to tell you what my favorite and least favorite books of the month were no one will be surprised to know that Tiamat's Wrath was my favorite book of the month because Naomi Nagata exists and I don't think like she might possibly be a better character than Annabeth Chase and if you know me you know what a humongous thing that is for me to have just said. Annabeth is my favorite character of all time so far. Naomi might just replace her. My least favorite book we'll say for this video is... I'm gonna stare at this really long because I know it is going to make Cal and Brianna sweat and curse at me and be really mad at me. But the actual least favorite is Prada and Prejudice by Mandy Hubbard. Um, it's not a bad book, and I think for its target audience, it really would have worked, but this is not something that you're gonna sit down as an adult and be like, yeah, I got something out of that. Those are all of the books that I read in the months of July and August, Jalogist, if you will. That's what we're calling it, because we just didn't read anything in July, basically. Just like two books is sad. It's sad. It is very, it's like just looking at it, I know I needed that time and I needed to take a break and whatever like it's fine that I only read two books but also I'm disappointed with myself that I only read two books I should be better than that if you are feeling chatty I would love to know what your favorite and or least favorite books of the months of July and August uh, are we'll just stick with August we'll just stick with August to make y'all's lives easier if you are not feeling chatty but you still want to let me know that you watched to the end of the video go ahead and leave me a robot emoji. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Also, if you enjoyed this video, I appreciate it. If you had checked out the videos over here, I will have a very fun announcement up top and then whatever is newest on my channel down here. That is it for now, my friends. Happy reading and I will see you later when we will talk about more wordy, nerdy things. Bye! Please note, I would never look away from the camera for that long of a time if it was not a bit. I do understand how you face the audience.